Okay. Very good. Anything else? Then, brothers and sisters, as God's people, let's worship him together. The word of forgiveness. Jesus said, Father, forgive these people. They don't know what they're doing. The word of salvation. When Jesus replied, I promise that today you will be with me in paradise. The word of relationship. When Jesus saw his mother and his favorite disciple with her, he said to his mother, this man is now your son. Then he said to the disciple, she is now your mother. From then on, the disciple took her into his own home. The words of humanity. Then about that time, Jesus shouted, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Also, Jesus knew that he had now finished his work and in order to make the scriptures come true, he said, I am thirsty. The word of triumph. After Jesus drank the wine, he said, everything is done. He bowed his head and died. Amen. As we start this service of worship, let's everybody stand up and let's open the service by singing a song uh, It'll be up on the screen in just a minute. Thank you. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. <laughs> One, two, three, five. <laughs>
the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever is true to reign. Heaven and earth rejoice His holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted. Exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted, the King is exalted in all.
you've got five or twenty dollars. Wow. You know what they call that? Inflation. That's inflation. When I was your age, a tooth was worth a quarter. Now it's worth like five bucks, five to twenty dollars. Well, I'll tell you, given the price of dentures, these teeth for me are worth more than that, more than twenty dollars. Okay. Um, how many of y'all and and this? How many of y'all go to some kind of school? Okay, y'all go to school, some kind of school. Okay, uh, and now I'm not sure, Ray Ray, this applies to you, but I think it applies to the rest of you. Have you ever had homework? Oh. Yeah, okay, homework. Yeah, you, all of y'all have had homework. I get homework every single day. You, oh, you've got homework before? You never did Well, she may have homework. You get homework every day? Every single day. Every single Do you have ever, ever have homework? Yeah. Okay, you ever have homework? Not a lot. Wait. It is coming. Homework, homework, um, yes, talk to Corbin right there. He'll tell you about homework uh, because he's in college and there's a lot of homework in college. But homework, now you're doing homework, right? And are you excited when you got homework? You're excited to do it? No. no. You're not excited to do homework? Unless it's bad. Unless it's bad. Okay, you got homework to do. Now, if you weren't doing homework, what would you prefer to do? What would you like to do rather than homework? What's that? What would, play? You'd rather play? You'd rather do it at school? And if you did it at school, what would you do at home in that time that it would free up? Watch TV? Video games. Okay? You could do other things, right, at home. Now, but you got homework to do, okay? So you're doing homework. And you're working, you're working, working on homework, right? And you do it, and you do it, and you do it, and finally, you're done. When you're done with your homework, how do you feel? And you got it sitting there on your, right next to your backpack. How do you feel? You feel good? You feel happy? You know, now you can do something else, right, with your time. Feel good when you're finished. That's what we're going to talk about today. Only, we're not going to be talking about homework. And we're not going to be talking about you doing homework. Instead, we're going to talk about how Jesus, at the end of his life, could look back and say, I'm finished. I've done what I was supposed to do. It's over. And he could look back and know that he did exactly what he was supposed to do. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Not just that he could say it, but what that means for us. Since Jesus has finished his job, his work, maybe it's time for us to do ours. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so let's bow our heads. Bow our heads. And let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for loving us as much as you do, and thank you for sending Jesus, who during his time here on earth finished the work he was sent here to do. Thank you. Now, help us pick up our pencils and pick up the torch and start doing the work we have to do. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Okay, everybody stand up. Everybody say, oh, thank you. All right, wait a minute, let me give you this. Oh, be careful, Chris. I want you all to have an outstanding day, an outstanding green day. Uh, and what do I want you to remember all week long? God loves us! Happy St. Patrick's Day! Outstanding. <laughs> we come now to the part of the service when we have the opportunity to lift our prayers to God. Now, there are some particular needs in the bulletin of which you may want to take note. 
Uh, also, you, we want to make sure we remember the family of Maxine Simpson, because Maxine passed away uh, a few days ago. Uh, her funeral service will be this afternoon, 2 o'clock, at Hiles. So um, if you're interested, you want to attend that. But we want to not remember her. She's been on our prayer list for a long time. Uh, she's fine. Uh, we want to remember her family uh, and her friends as they deal with this loss. So are there any updates or additions? Uh, Bob, how, how did Christy make out? Good? Wow, Discharge Friday. That's, that's really good. Now we got a slower recovery. Well, that's outstanding. So that's good news. I think that warrants an amen. Okay. So, and I talked to Peg, a couple, I've talked to Peg a couple of times. May, she made it through her surgery. And of course, because this is the way, this is the world in which we live. And this is a good thing. I'm not saying this is a bad. She had, they had surgery on Tuesday morning. And she slept in her own bed Tuesday night. So, with a new knee. I don't understand it, but I think it's a wonderful thing, and, and she was able to do that, and it was, worked out well. So it wasn't that they were just shoving her out of the hospital. Uh, so this is, a, this is remarkable, but she's doing fine, but still could use our prayers. Are there any additions? Or, yes. Carrie's having some surgery on Wednesday. Okay. Yeah, so we want to lift her up. And, and again, we had a lot of surgery. You went through your surgery last week. And uh, not even a Tylenol. Wow. Not, 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 not even a Tylenol and 25 bucks. Yeah, I bet you you won't get 25 bucks. I know, I know. The adult tooth, tooth doesn't even sound look natural. It was curved all over the place. So you're, you're a brave guy. So that's outstanding. Anything else? So we, yes, we want to remember you in our prayers. Yes, Andy. Ooh, that's bad. No, I don't imagine. What's her first name? Do you know? God knows. God, God knows. So, yeah, well, <laughs> Dave and Eric's mother. I think that sounds really good. So we, we definitely want to lift her up in our prayers. Anything else we want to remember? Well, then let's go to God now in prayer, and I'll open. Uh, part of the prayer will be confession, so we're ready to hear God's word. Then you all will have the opportunity to lift your prayers to God, and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. So let's go before God now in prayer. Lord God, before we say anything else, we've got to thank you for giving us the opportunity to be together this morning uh, as we pass through this, this season and, uh, and approach Easter. We want to give you thanks and praise for allowing us to be here. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity, so we are, we are truly grateful. You know, in, in just a little bit, we're going to hear your word read and proclaimed, and, and as you know, we've been looking at the last words your son and our Savior said as he was on the cross, and, and today we're going to be looking at him saying that it's finished, that his work here is, is done. And, and although we can pretty much accept that, pretty much, sometimes we assume that you know, his, the work that he actually came to do needs to continue, we can kind of accept that his work is done, but we don't translate it to ourselves. I mean, since he came down, lived, and returned to his father, sometimes we don't pick up his mantle. We don't progress in doing his work, even though that's what he told us to do. Instead, we take a step back, 
and we focus on ourselves rather than taking a step forward and focusing on all those needs and concerns around us. We fail to respond to these words Christ spoke. And, and when we do that, we ask for your forgiveness because that's not what you intended us to do. In fact, we ask you to, to reshape not only our perspectives, but also our wills so that we're ready and, and willing and able to step out into our, into our world as your witnesses. Help us serve you by serving others. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And now in the privacy of our own hearts, we're going to lift up to you the concerns that we've heard shared. We're going to lift up to you the, the needs that are in the bulletin. And we're going to lay before you all those concerns that weigh heavy on our heart. Lord God, hear us as we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening to us, and thank you for loving us as much as you do. But right now, thank you for responding to us. Thank you for forgiving us. And thank you for addressing our needs. And we know that you will, because we've offered these needs up to you in the name of Christ our Savior, who taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would the ushers come forward to collect our offering?
Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to make this offering to you. Guide and direct the leaders of this congregation that these, our gifts, may be put to good and effective use. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Now, is it, is it just me, or are we flying through the month of March? I mean, it seems like just yesterday that we were counting down how many days we had left in winter, and not including today, the number is two, for crying out loud. For me, I'm telling you, March is becoming a blur. And even though I believe that no one should wish their life away, that's actually okay with me. In fact, I wouldn't shed a single tear if we could jump from March 5th all the way to April 1st. But I'll tell you, that didn't used to be the case. Not, not for me. You see, when I was younger, I absolutely loved basketball. That's the Virginia Squires. Although I'm not entirely sure I know why. I mean, I was generally the guy on the team who was short, but made up for it by being slow. During my playing days, I, I sort of viewed my little place on the bench as a home away from home. I think I even scratched my initials there. Still, in spite of my, wait for it, shortcomings, yeah, that's pretty bad, I loved basketball, which made this particular month a big deal. When I, was, when I was younger. You see, when I was growing up in Virginia, every March, about 25 conference winners played a single elimination tournament to determine the National Basketball Collegiate Championship. Champion. And when it was over, only one team, and it was often UCLA, only one team would come out on top. And they'd be able to look back on their season knowing that they had done everything they needed to do, everything they had set out to accomplish, while all the other teams would go back and start looking at next year. Now, for me, that was March madness, although I don't think they called it that back then. And trust me, when I was between the ages of 10 and 22, man, in my mind, this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I'll tell you, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about this morning. You know, what we can do now that something far more important than the basketball season is, is over. Of course, this is the fifth message in a series we started back in February, dealing with what Jesus said from the cross. And over that time, we've talked about words that remind us of forgiveness and salvation as well as the new relationship we can enjoy with God and with one another, as well as the basic humanity Jesus displayed in his life. And this morning, we're going to continue this by focusing on these words from the Gospel of John. You see, this was what John wrote. After Jesus drank the wine, he said, everything is done. He bowed his head and died. Now, for the evangelist, these were the very last words Jesus said from the cross. And with that in mind, this morning, we're going to take these words and we're going to consider two truths that I believe they convey. One dealing with Jesus and the other focused on us. For example, based on what Jesus said from the cross, I think it's pretty clear that Jesus knew that he had finished his work on earth. Jesus knew this. As a matter of fact, that's exactly how it's translated in the King James Version. 
It is finished. And you know, when you think about it, based on what Jesus knew, that statement was certainly true for three very definite reasons. I mean, first, he certainly knew that he had accomplished his mission, right? In other words, the reason he came down from heaven in the first place, Jesus must have recognized that he had done everything he came to do. And I'm talking about the mission that John outlined right at the beginning of his gospel. Just listen to what he wrote. In the beginning was the one who is called the Word. The Word was with God and was truly God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. And with this Word, God created all things. Nothing was made without the Word. Everything that was created received its life from Him. And His life gave light to everyone. The light keeps shining in the dark, and the darkness has never put it out. The true light that shines on everyone was coming into the world. The Word was in the world, but no one knew Him. Though God had made the world with His Word, He came into His own world, but His own nation did not welcome Him. Yet some people accepted Him and put their faith in Him, so He gave them the right to be the children of God. They are not the children, God's children by nature or because of any human desires. God gave Himself, God Himself was the one who made them His children. The Word became a human being and lived here among us, or with us. We saw His true glory, the glory of the only Son of the Father. From Him the complete gifts of undeserved grace and truth have come down to us. Now for the evangelist John, this was the mission. This was the mission when the Word became a human being and lived here with us. You see, the sun came down to be a light shining in the darkness. The sun came down to reveal the glory of the Father. The sun came down to draw all of God's people together. And you know, during his life, that's exactly what Jesus did. And I think that's the first example of how he knew that he'd finished his work. But you know, that's not all. Because second, I think Jesus also knew that he had communicated his message. You see, by the time he had been lifted up on the cross, he'd already explained to people exactly what was going to happen and why. Something that he told Nicodemus in the third chapter of this gospel. I mean, just listen to what Jesus said to this Pharisee who came to talk to him in the middle of the night. The Son of Man must be lifted up. Just as a metal snake was lifted up by Moses in the desert, then everyone who has faith in the Son of Man will have eternal life. God loved the people of this world so much that he gave his only Son so that everyone who has faith in him will have eternal life and never really die. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn its people. He sent him to save them. No one who has faith in God's Son will be condemned, but everyone who doesn't have faith in Him has already been condemned for not having faith in God's only Son. The light has come into the world, and people do evil things, and people who do evil things are judged guilty because they love the dark more than the light. People who hate who do evil hate the light and won't come to the light because it clearly shows what they've done. But everyone who lives by the truth will come to the light because they want others to know that, that God is really the one doing what they do. Now, that's what Jesus said to this man who came out of a dark place into the light. That the Son of Man came not with a whole bunch of fire and brimstone and but, to, but rather to announce a simple and straightforward decision that all those within earshot had and have. You see, based on, on what he said, 
based on his message. We got a choice. We can choose to play it safe and stay in the dark. We can do that. I mean, we could choose to reject who the Son is and, and was and what he came to do. And we could choose to separate ourselves from the life and the hope and the peace that he offers. You see, this is something we can choose. Because the dark is just so incredibly comfortable. Or we can decide to take a chance and to step into the light, revealing exactly who we are. And we can decide to accept who the Son was and what He came to bring. And we can decide to experience a little bit of eternal life right now where we live and work. You see, during his life, that was the message Jesus communicated. And that was the third thing I believe Jesus knew that he'd done right before he died. And third, Jesus also knew that he was about to empower his followers through a promise that he'd already made. In other words, before he died on that cross, to those folks who had been involved in his mission and who had listened and heard his message, Jesus had already told them about a source of power that they were going to have after he'd gone back to the Father. I mean, just listen to what he said to his disciples right before his arrest and crucifixion. I was with you at the first, and so I didn't tell you these things. But now I'm going back to the Father who sent me, and none of you asked me where I'm going. You are very sad from hearing this, but I tell you I'm going to do what is best for you. This is why I'm going away. The Holy Spirit cannot come to help you until I leave, but after I'm gone, I will send you the Holy Spirit. I will send the Holy Spirit to you. The Spirit will come and show the people of this world the truth about sin and God's justice and judgment. The Spirit will show them that they are wrong about sin because they don't have faith in me. They are wrong about God's justice because I'm going to the Father and you won't see me again. And they are wrong about the judgment because God has already judged the ruler of the world. I have much more to say to you. But right now, it would be more than you could understand. The Spirit shows what is true and will come and guide you into the full truth. The Spirit doesn't speak on its own. He will tell you only what he has heard from me. And he will let you know what is going to happen. The Spirit will bring glory to me by taking my message and telling it to you. Now, that's what Jesus promised his disciples. That a source of power that would enable them to, to not only keep going after he'd returned home, but also to respond to his mission by announcing his message. That power was common. And in this way, before his death, he'd already empowered his followers with this enormous promise. And for me, that's the third example of how Jesus had actually finished the work he came to do. And so when he said from the cross, everything is done, I think Jesus meant it. His work on earth was finished. He was returning to the Father. But that was him. What about us? What do these words mean to us? And how might they shape what we say and do now that the Son has returned to the Father? In other words, having established the what, now we're left with the so what. And even though I guess you could take this in a lot of different directions, for me, I think the answer is really, really clear. You see, I believe these words from the cross remind us, they challenge us, that now is our time to act. 
In other words, since Jesus' work on earth is, earth is finished, now it's up to us. Now it's up to us to respond. Now it's up to us to, to show that we understand his mission and accept his message and claim the power he offers. Now it's up to us. And I'll tell you, just like we broke his knowledge into three parts, I think there are three things we already know as we try to figure out how we're going to respond. For example, I think we already know our mission. We already know. And I'll tell you, although sometimes we make this word mission something that is really demanding and sounds really difficult, personally, I think our mission is incredibly simple. You see, when, they were, when he was talking about their mission, talking to his disciples, this is exactly what he told them to do. And spoiler alert, what Jesus tells them doesn't involve learning rocket science or going to the other side of the world. This is what he said to him, and this is what he says to us. Now I tell you to love each other as I have loved you. The greatest way to show love for friends is to die for them, and you are my friends if you obey me. Servants don't know what their master is doing, and so I don't speak to you as my servants. I speak to you as my friends, and I have told you everything my father has told me. You did not choose me. I chose you and sent you out to produce fruit, the kind of fruit that will last. Then my father will give you whatever you ask for in my name. So I command you to love each other. Now that's what he said. And frankly, I don't know that he could have been more clear. I mean, and these aren't rhetorical questions. Do you want to do what God wants you to do? Do you want to do what God wants you to do? Yes or no? Yes. Love one another. Do you want to produce the kind of fruit that lies? Yes. Love one another. Do you want to receive everything you need to do what God has called you to do? Do you? Yes. yes. Love one another. Like I said, it's not rocket science. It's all about loving one another as we've been loved. Now that's our mission. And that's the first thing. We already know, because Jesus told us. But that's not all. Because second, I think we also know the message. And I'm talking about the same message that Jesus communicated through both his words and his work. And I'll tell you, I believe the evangelist John also knew exactly what the message was and offered a way for everybody to know it too. I mean, just listen to what he wrote at the end of his gospel. Jesus worked many other miracles for his disciples, and not all of them are written in this book. But these are written so that you will put your faith in Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God. If you have faith in him, you will have true life. You see, we know the message. Why do we know the message? because it's right here in this book. I'm telling you everything we need to know about God and about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit is right here. Thank you, Jordan. That is exactly right. Everything we need is right here in the Bible, in the Biblos. In fact, in Greek, Biblos means the book. But you know, for as remarkable as this is, paraphrasing one of my favorite politicians of all time, Vice President Cactus Jack Garner, it ain't worth a bucket of spit 
although he didn't use the word spit. If you don't read it. You see, to know this, you got to look at it. You see, if we dust it off, open it up, and actually take it in, man, we have got the message, right? And that's the second thing we already know. And finally, I believe we also know that we've been given power. You see, we've got the power to know and the power to do and the power to feel. In other words, right here and now, we've got the power to become everything we were created to be and to say everything we were created to say and to do everything we were created to do. And I'll tell you, this divine power is grounded in something Jesus did soon after the resurrection. Just listen. The disciples were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And on the evening of, the same, of that same Sunday, they locked themselves in a room. Suddenly, Jesus appeared in the middle of the group. He greeted them and showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw Jesus, they became very happy. After Jesus had greeted them, he said, I am sending you just as the Father has sent me. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they will be forgiven. But if you don't forgive their sins, they will not be forgiven. Now that's what Jesus did. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And what he did for them, brothers and sisters, he's done for us. Since that's true, now the ball's in our court, isn't it? I mean, Jesus has already breathed on us, right? That's already happened. He's already breathed on us. We can choose to avoid it. Or we could choose to ignore it. Or we could choose to deny it. But you know what we can't do? We can't stop it. Therefore, like it or not, right now we have power. We can pretend we don't, but that doesn't change the fact that we do. You see, we have the power to claim our mission. And we have the power to share the message. In other words, we have the power to be and to speak and to engage. And even though I know this sounds more Pentecostal than Presbyterian, I'm telling you through the Holy Spirit, we have God's power. Now we've got to decide what we're going to do about it. And that's the third thing I believe we know. And I'll tell you, that's good. It's good that we know all this stuff. Since when you get right down to it, now is our time to act. Okay. You remember me telling you about how every single year I'd look forward to March? Back when I was, well, younger than I am right now? Well, as some of you all know, maybe most of you all know, a little bit later this evening what's going to happen? A uh -huh, selection, right. A committee is going to get together and they're going to select 25, no, 68 schools that are going to participate in March Madness 2024. And even though the number of teams has more than doubled, and along with the conference champions, there'll be a whole lot of at-large selections, still the tournament is exciting. It's exciting. And although I don't watch much college basketball, like almost none, I'll watch some of this. And in the end, only one team is going to be the national champions. Therefore, the members of only one team will be able to look back and say they finished their season just the way they wanted, while everybody else will look forward to next year. And you know, I think the same kind of thing is going on. 
after Jesus drank the wine and said, everything is done, and then bowed his head and died. You see, when he said it, I believe Jesus was recognizing that he had already finished his work on earth. And when we hear it, well, in a very real, real way, it becomes a reminder and a challenge that now it's our time to act. And for me, whether this is actually a word of triumph or not, well, that may be shaped by how we choose to respond. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for sending your son, the word, the light, down into our world. Thank you for enabling him to live for through his life. He proclaimed your message and promised your power. And then when his work was done, he returned to you. Lord God, help us to be thankful for, for this, for what he's done. But more than that, help us to use that as a, as a motivation to get out and do your work in the world that we have. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Now, before we close the service by uh, singing a song, I offer to you all this invitation. If there's anybody here who has, uh, feels the grace of God in a special way and is in interested in how he or she might respond, talk to me after the service. If you've got a question about the sermon or the service, please come and talk to me about that as well. Now, let's all stand and I'll tell you, we are, we are going to sing, and this may not be one that's real familiar to her, but I'm going to let you in on it. This may be my favorite hymn. My favorite hymn. I've it, never heard of it. You know, oh. Oh, well, you're putting pressure on Grateful, it. Yes, that's right. And I know every note. Oh, okay. Yeah. So let's all stand it. and let's sing. Oh, yeah. sing a song of sing Bethlehem. Sing out loud. Sing. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's exactly what you want. Yeah. <laughs> Cover up.
thank you. Hey, I think both Amanda and Scott deserve a round of applause because they made it through a song that wasn't familiar. And Jake, as always, thank you so much for doing an outstanding job with the board, keeping me straight, and lighting candles without a fatality. Nobody's hair went up in flames, and that's always a good thing. Brothers and sisters, go now in peace. And know that Jesus said from the cross, it's finished. His work here is done. When his work ended, our work began. Let that be the motivator for our words and our actions. And to empower this walk, receive the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the people of God said, Amen.